It's been five years since Canada saw its first reported case of COVID-19. The virus quickly sending the world into lockdown. In the months that followed, it claims lives, livelihoods, and our previous notions of what is, quote, normal. Now half a decade has passed. What have we learned? Could we be on the verge of a similar pandemic? And if so, are we prepared? Here to answer these questions and more is epidemiologist Dr. Danuta Skravonsky. Welcome, doctor. Thank you. So the first question I'd like to get into with you is how likely are we to see another pandemic at the level of COVID-19 in our lifetime? The honest answer is we don't know. There are certainly some concerning signals associated with a particular virus that we've been watching for decades, but that is showing unprecedented expansion globally and in animal hosts, animal populations. So uh, I would say that we are concerned, but nobody can predict exactly when a pandemic may happen again. We know it will happen, but we can't tell you the, the exact time that that's going to occur. What does it take for an infectious disease to go from that infectious disease to become a pandemic? That's a great question because it's not easy actually to establish pandemics and that may be why we've been watching this H5N1 virus for 25 years since 1997 and along the way experts have said oh we're just a few mutations away from this establishing a pandemic and each time of course well they've been wrong there are some preconditions that are required for pandemics whether due to uh, influenza or due to coronaviruses to occur the first is we see uh, introduction of a novel pathogen uh, a virus typically. Uh, typically a respiratory virus because spread through the respiratory route is efficient once it gets established. But the first um, prerequisite is a novel virus uh, infecting humans and humans having virtually no or no uh, prior experience with that virus, no immunity and therefore large swaths of the population being susceptible. So those are the first two conditions, a novel virus and human susceptibility. Those are necessary but insufficient criteria because beyond that, the virus has to be able to successfully replicate in its new human environment and not only that, be able to transmit from person to person. So there's a number of steps that viruses have to go through in order to establish pandemic potential. But I will say that whenever there is a novel virus and the human population is broadly susceptible, in public health, we pay very, very close attention because the goal is containment. The goal is to prevent a pandemic because as you just saw with COVID, once a pandemic gets going, it, is, it can be quite catastrophic in terms of human health and economies, uh, our social interactions, et cetera, and of course, hospitalizations and deaths. So we wanna shut it down as early as possible and prevent that sustained transmission from occurring. Are there any infectious diseases on your radar that we should be worried about? Well, we are all quite preoccupied right now with the avian influenza virus H5N1, um, which as I say, first arose in 1997. And since then it's caused uh, nearly a thousand human infections of which about half have died. So in the grand scheme of things, a thousand cases in the worldwide population since 1997, this is a rare human infection still, albeit it can be quite a severe infection as we just recently learned with that adolescent in British Columbia. Some total though it is still a rare infection but it is showing some important differences. It has expanded globally. It used to be we were watching it in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in the Middle East but since around about 2020 it expanded broadly beyond that into Europe, into North America, Canada and the US and along the way it's been infecting mammals whereas this has been typically an avian, a bird virus. It has found its way to infect other mammals, including nearly a thousand cattle herds in the U.S., 
cats, felines, uh, both uh, domestic and wild and in the zoo, um, they seem particularly susceptible to this virus and there have also been spillover sporadic human infections occurring in North America as well. So that unprecedented opportunity for this virus to come into contact with the human host and maybe find a way to mutate and adapt and establish itself in people more generally is a very serious concern that we're watching. But I can tell you over the 25 years that I've been monitoring uh, avian and other emerging influenza viruses, it's always when we're looking in this direction that something happens over here. So we have to stay broadly open to possibilities with this virus while preparing for what is actually happening now with that H5N1 virus. The other thing I will say, containment may not be possible. Containment means stopping people, additional people from becoming infected. But when the virus is so widespread now in multiple, not only avian, poultry, for instance, and mammalian, cattle, cats, um, wide variety of mammals, the idea of being able to stop all cases from occurring um, it becomes much more um, difficult. And so we should be thinking beyond containment also, how can we prepare for a pandemic if, when it becomes established? What have we learned from the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of healthcare system capacity, in terms of vaccine development, uh, evaluation, deployment? And for influenza vaccines, we would probably need two doses so how will we roll that out? And treatments, medications, antivirals. So all of these, we, in um, emerging pathogens, we're thinking about what's happening now, but we always have an eye to the future. How should we be preparing if this does establish pandemic spread? We recently heard about the first reported death in the U.S. from avian flu. What do we know about this disease specifically and how it's transmitted? Mm -hmm. Well, this is that H5N1 virus that I was just referring to that has shown unprecedented geographic and host range spread. We've not seen this with this virus in the past 25 years. So the pandemic threat level is increased. However, the virus has actually not yet met the criteria to establish pandemic spread. It still has to go through some more steps. It needs to adapt to the human host. This virus actually prefers the gut of birds. It's somehow trying to infect the respiratory tract of humans. That's very foreign territory for it. So it needs to adapt first, then it needs to be able to replicate and then be able to spread from person to person. We've not gone through those steps yet. The issue is every single case, human case, of influenza, novel influenza, gives that virus a chance to find its way, its legs, if you like, within this novel human host. And we want to contain that and stop that. So every single single case is important from a public health perspective, but that doesn't change the fact that the risk for the general population still remains low. And I know that may seem hard to reconcile, but that is an actual uh, appraisal of the current risk to the human population. But we don't want to see any cases of this novel virus in humans. So is the avian flu a good candidate for the next potential pandemic? Indeed it is. But I will reinforce, it has been for 25 years, and it has still not yet established that capacity. And again, it's not just H5N1 that we are watching. There are a multitude of avian influenza viruses in birds that we have to keep an eye on. Uh, of that multitude of viruses over millennia, less than a handful have acquired the ability to infect humans in a sustained uh, transmissible way, uh, but we have to keep an eye on those viruses because humans are quite susceptible to them. What about other diseases like RSV, for example? Well, RSV is an established human pathogen, and I'm glad you raised that because while we're focused on um, novel avian influenza viruses, and especially very severe cases such as the adolescent in BC or the individual in Louisiana who just died from H5N1, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there are respiratory viruses that have already established easy 
person to person transmission. RSV being one of those, seasonal influenza being one of those, and now, alas, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 being one of those. And we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that those viruses cause a substantial disease burden, far more than the 1,000 cases globally since 1997 of H5N1. And moreover, we have vaccines that can protect us from influenza, from COVID-19, and now also RSV uh, increasingly um, available. So we should avail ourselves of the prevention measures that thankfully are available to us against those diseases that are causing far more disease burden right now in the human population. So what did we learn from COVID-19 and how has it prepared us for disease management going forward? Well, first of all, I do want to say that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, it was an important lesson. Uh, it was quite severe in part because we were uniformly susceptible. With influenza viruses, we have seen influenza viruses before. And so, for instance, with this H5N1 virus, we may not be totally susceptible in the human population. We have seen, for instance, H1N1 viruses and the overlap between those. There may be some cross protection that could uh, attenuate the severity of uh, an H5N1 pandemic, for instance. So all of that has to be part of our risk assessment. But I would say in terms of the response activities, uh, look how important early availability and rollout of vaccine was against COVID-19. Uh, we will certainly be wanting that for... Uh once they establish pandemic uh, potential or capacity, and we could be working on the development and evaluation of those vaccines now, because the goal, if, when uh, uh, novel influenza viruses establish pandemic spread, is uh, first <laughs> to contain it, shut it down if we can, drive it back into nature, but if we can't do that, what we're really after is vaccines uh, to protect, to uh, prevent uh, infection, but more importantly, severe outcomes. So what did we learn? The crucial importance of um, uh, vaccine uh, development and deployment, I would say first and foremost. When it comes to infectious diseases, what is your biggest concern? Well, Pandemic viruses with pandemic potential, respiratory viruses in particular, are uh, clearly uh, important. Uh, I do want to emphasize, though, that there are already humanized viruses, like we just talked about, RSV, influenza, COVID, that um, um, cause far more severe disease burden on an annual basis that we should be, as a general community and population, addressing, because we have the tools to do that. It's our job like I say, to be thinking ahead to what about these other viruses, animal viruses, H5N1 is a, a, a clear contender right now. It's our job to keep an eye on that, but I don't want the population or people to go away thinking, oh, well, we're on uh, the edge of a pandemic that's about to happen. That's not the case. Um, this virus has some steps to go before it acquires the ability that way, and it may, may never right? Uh, but in public health, it's our job to uh, take that worst case scenario uh, and do more than hope for the best, uh, prepare for the worst, actually. So um, H5N1 is certainly a preoccupation of ours right now. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure.